Now, we come to chapter 24, and Abraham sends his trusted servant to get a bride for Isaac back in Mesopotamia in the land of Haran, and the success of the servant in securing Rebekah. And here's one of those, let me say, beautiful chapters of the Bible. Tells a lovely story. Very beautiful story, by the way. I want to begin reading. I will not get very far in this chapter, but we're going to see a wonderful love story. And again, it'll reveal that God is interested in the man that you marry, young lady. And he's interested in the young lady that you marry, young man. God's interested in it. I believe that there are two things that God has given to the human family. One is marriage, and the other is capital punishment, or that is human government. God permits man to rule himself today, and that is something I think that's universal. And these are two very important things. Now, when these are broken, a government will fall apart. You see, the home is the background of any government. God knew that, and he made that in marriage. And we find the same thing true relative to government. A government must have the power to take human life in order to protect human life. That is the purpose of it, because human life is sacred. That's the reason God gave these laws. Now, he's interested in your love story. And it's wonderful when you bring God into it. You'll find out that the first miracle our Lord performed was when he went to a wedding, Cana of Galilee. I don't know how many weddings he went to, but he went to that one. And now, as we come to this 24th chapter, "...and Abraham was old, well stricken in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things." Now he's going to send his servant to get a bride for Isaac. Now the 24th chapter of the book of Genesis, friends, is one of the richest sections of the Word of God because it tells a love story that goes way back to the very beginning. You can see how social life was way back in those days. And this is a very dramatic account that is given here of the way that a bride was secured for Isaac. And again, there is a fantastic picture that is presented here to us, which we'll see a spiritual picture. Now, last time we barely got our foot in the door. I merely read one verse just to introduce us to this chapter. And here we saw that Abraham, he's old, well stricken in age, the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. Now, he wants to get a bride for his son Isaac, and he doesn't want to get a bride in that section of those people there that were given to idolatry and paganism. And so he sends back to his people back in the land of Haran. Now, notice how he does it. And actually, we've come in chapter 24 to a break in the division. You will recall that I said that the first part of Genesis, first 11 chapters, four great events. The last section, beginning with chapter 12 through 50, four outstanding individuals. Now, from Genesis 12 to 23, we've had Abraham, the man of faith. Now we have Isaac, the beloved son. And there are three great events in the life of Isaac. And frankly, we've already seen two of them. One is his birth. And the second was his offering by Abraham. And third, his bride. They say there are three great events in a man's life. One is his birth. One's his death. And then one is his marriage. And they say that he has no choice except of the middle one, of marriage. And sometimes they don't seem to have much choice in that connection. But nevertheless, these are the three great events. Now, two of these events, the birth of Isaac, and now we come to the one, his bride, and how he secured that bride. This is a very wonderful chapter, and there are two things that I want you to notice as we go through the chapter. 
One is the leading of the Lord in all the details of the lives of those involved here. It's a remarkable statement that's made time and time again, how God led. And that leads me to say, even in this early day, there were those in that climate, that social climate, that were looking to God and following his leading. And this is supposed to be way back yonder in the Stone Age. Man was a caveman and pretty much uncivilized. Don't believe a word of it. Here's a record that goes back there. And man's not that kind of a man at all. He's a caveman today, but not back there. And we find here the leading of God. Now, if God could lead back in that day in the lives of these folk, he can lead today in your life and my life. And this puts down a pattern for us. That's the first thing to notice. The second thing is the straightforward manner in which Rebecca made her decision to go with the servant, become the bride of Isaac. That is a tremendous thing. We'll notice it as we go through. We get to that later on. But you keep your eye out for that and your ear open. I'm reading now verse 2. Genesis 24, And Abraham said unto his eldest servant of his house that ruled over all that he had, Put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh, and I will make thee swear by the Lord. Now, that's the way men took an oath in that day. Didn't raise their right hand and put the left hand on a Bible. Didn't have a Bible to begin with. Frankly, I don't think it's necessary for anybody to put your hand on the Bible to swear. If it's necessary to get you to tell the truth to do that, then it may be you won't tell the truth. But here, this was the method in that day. A man put his hand in the thigh of the man that he's going to make an oath to. And so this servant, and I think it's Eliezer, he was the head servant in the home of Abraham, and he had a son. Remember, Abraham called God's attention to that. Now, God says to him in verse 3, I'll make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. My Christian friend today, you got a boy in your home or a girl in your home that's marriageable, you ought to pray that they'll not marry one of the Canaanites because they're still in the land. And there is always a danger of our young people marrying one of the Canaanites. And if you do, someone has said, if you're going to have the devil for your father-in-law, you're going to have trouble with him. You always do. And now will you notice, Abraham here says, to his servant, verse 4, But thou shalt go unto my country, to my kindred, and take a wife unto my son Isaac. And the servant said unto him, Peradventure the woman will not be willing to follow me unto this land. Must I needs bring thy son again unto the land from whence thou camest? And Abraham said unto him, Beware that thou bring not my son thither again. The servant said, Now suppose I can't find a girl that will come with me. Shall I come back and get Isaac and take him to that land? And Abraham said, Never take him back. This is the place where God wants us. And do not turn him to that land under any circumstance. That's very important, by the way, to see. Now, verse 7, The Lord God of heaven, which took me from my father's house, and from the land of my kindred, and which spake unto me, and that swear unto me, saying, Unto thy seed will I give this land. He shall send his angel before thee, and thou shalt take a wife unto my son from thence. Now, Abraham is really a man of faith. He demonstrates it again and again, and here he's magnificent. He says to this servant, You can count on God leading you. God has promised me this. Now, you see, he's not taking a leap in the dark. Faith is not a leap in the dark. It must rest upon the Word of God. I find a great many people today, they say, well, I believe God and it'll come to pass. Well, fine. It's wonderful for you to believe God. But do you have something in writing from God? 
Abraham always asked for it in writing. And he had it in writing from God. God had made a contract with him. And he says, God has promised me that through my seed, and that's Isaac, that he's going to bring a blessing to the world. Now, you can be sure of one thing. God has a bride back there for Isaac. And you see, he rests upon what God has said. We need not be foolish today. Faith is not foolishness. It's resting upon something. It's always reasonable. It's never a leap in the dark. It's not betting your life that this will come to pass or that will come to pass. It's not a gamble. It's a sure thing. Faith is the real sure thing. And Abraham here is sure. He said, you can be sure of that. Now, he says, though, if the woman will not be willing to follow thee, then thou shalt be clear of this, my oath, only bring not my son thither again. Don't ever return my son back there. But if the woman won't come, then you are discharged. Well, what does that mean? It means simply this. Abraham would, have, I think, have told you very frankly, well, God has another way of working this out. I don't know what it'll be. But he says, I'm sure of one thing, that this is the way God wants it done. Now, friends, that's what faith is. Faith is acting upon the Word of God. It rests upon something. And God wants us to believe his word and not just believe this pious nonsense that I hear today, that you can force God to do something and that God has to do it because I believe it. May I say to you, no one wants to be healed more than I have. And I believe in divine healing. And I've made it through now with cancer in my body. And don't tell me now that I don't believe in faith healing. I do. But I want to say this. When somebody comes along and says that you can force God and that God has to do it, God will heal you and demand it, I'm not in that position yet. I don't know what his will is. But whatever his will is, I want that done. But I want to make very sure that we pray and ask God to do something. But God will have to be the one to de determine whether it's his will or not. Now, Abraham's got something to rest upon. He's not demanding anything of God. He says, well, if this doesn't work out, then God has another way to work it out. And we can always be sure of that. Verse 9, And the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham his master, swear to him concerning that matter. Now watch the servant as he goes out to get a bride for Isaac. And the servant took ten camels of the camels of his master and departed. For all the goods of his master were in his hand, and he arose and went to Mesopotamia under the city of Nahor. Now, may I stop just to make this comment. I make the statement that there weren't just three wise men that came in on three camels to Jerusalem. That wouldn't have created a stir in the city. I believe there were nearer 300 camels that came in and 300 wise men. And the Scripture would seem to bear that out. There's no number given, of course. The number of gifts, that is, the kind of gifts, three kinds of gifts. But that doesn't confine it to three wise men. But you'll notice here, even the servant that's going to Mesopotamia to get a bride for Isaac. He takes ten camels along, and that means somebody had to ride them. He took along quite a retinue of servants. Now, notice what he does. He says here, And he departed, for all the goods of his master were in his hand. In other words, he had charge of all of the chattels and all the possessions of Abraham. And he arose, and he went to Mesopotamia under the city of Nahor. And he made his camels to kneel down without the city by a well of water at the time of the evening, even the time that women go out to draw water. Now, that may seem strange to you that the women came out to draw water, but they were the ones that did the watering of the camels in that day. Very frankly, women did lots more work in those days, friends, than they do today. I mean by that hard work. The women were the ones that watered the stock and took care of them. Now, the men were supposed to be out trading, of course, and they were supposed to be out doing other work. Now, they were not 
always loafing by any means. But it's interesting to note this was the custom of that day, even the time that women go out to draw water. Now, this servant was waiting. It was not the proper thing for him to water his camels, a stranger, before others came there that lived in that community. And he said, now notice, this servant that's depending on God, and you find Abraham also put all of this in the hands of the Lord. And now the servant, listen to him, he prays. He said, O Lord God of my master Abraham, I pray thee, send me good speed this day, and show kindness unto my master Abraham. Behold, I stand here by the well of water, and the daughters of the men of the city come out to draw water, and let it come to pass that the damsel to whom I shall say, Let down thy pitcher, I pray thee that I may drink, and she shall say, Drink, and I will give the camels drink also. Let the same be she that thou hast appointed for thy servant Isaac, and thereby shall I know that thou hast showed kindness unto my master. Now his prayer is something like this. The daughters of the men of the city will be coming out. I do not know. That is, I'm speaking for this servant. Now, that servant would say, I do not know which one to choose. And so it's just left up to me. Pick one of them. Now, I pray that the one that I pick might be the one that God picks. In other words, he calls upon the Lord to lead him in making the right choice. Now, who do you think he's going to pick? Well, he's a man. He's going to pick the best looking when it comes out. And you can be sure of one thing. Rebecca was a good-looking woman. We need to emphasize that today. The Puritans had an idea that beauty was of the devil. Well, the devil is beautiful. He's an angel of light, by the way. But he doesn't have it all. God, after all, is the creator. And you've never seen a sunset I looked in a beautiful flower that he didn't make it. And he makes women beautiful. And there's nothing wrong with that. And this man's going to pick the beautiful one. He'd be a pretty poor servant. If he didn't, I'll say that. And I'm sure he picked the best looking one that came out. Now, verse 15, came to pass before he'd done speaking that, behold, Rebekah came out, who was born to Bethuel, son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, with her pitcher upon her shoulder. And here comes out the very one. And the damsel was very fair to look upon a virgin Neither had any man known her, and she went down to the well and filled her pitcher and came up. I told you she'd be good-looking, and I knew it was coming, of course, but she was good-looking. The Word of God says it, friends. Nothing wrong with that. I resent that Hollywood and the devil today in the theater gets beauty. I think the Lord ought to have some of it. He made it to begin with, and there's nothing wrong with him using a lovely person and a beautiful person, fine-looking men and women. I pray always God will call that kind into his service today. Now, will you notice, the damsel is very fair to look upon, just not an ordinary girl. She would have won the beauty contest. She's a virgin. Neither had any man known her. And she went down to the well, filled her pitcher, and came up. Now, verse 17, and the servant ran to meet her and said, Let me, I pray thee, drink a little water of thy pitcher. And she said, Drink, my Lord. And she hasted and let down her pitcher upon her hand and gave him drink. And when she had done giving him drink, she said, I'll draw water for thy camels also until they have done drinking. Now, the important thing for you and me to note here is that she's a very polite girl also, very courteous. She's beautiful, not dumb, and very polite. You can be sure that she probably is not a modern girl by any means. She could certainly qualify. And she hasted and emptied her pitcher into the trough, ran again into the well to draw water, and drew for all his camels. And remember, there were ten of those camels there, and I don't know when the last time they fell their hump. It's just like filling a radiator in a car to fill those camels up. Now, will you notice... Verse 21, And the man wondering at her held his peace, to wit whether the Lord had made his journey prosperous or not. 
the servant, he just stands there in amazement. He's wondering whether this is it, whether God is leading or not. He believes he is. Verse 22, it came to pass as the camels had done drinking that the man took a golden earring of half a shekel weight and two bracelets for her hands of ten shekel weight of gold and said, Whose daughter art thou? Tell me, I pray thee, is there in thy father's house room for us to lodge in? She said unto him, I'm the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Melchah, which she bare unto Nahor, and Nahor's brother Abraham. She said, Moreover unto him, We have both straw and provender enough and room to lodge in. And the man bowed down his head and worshiped the Lord. He sees the hand of God in it. Wonderful to have God leading and guiding, isn't it? And notice here, verse 27, he said, Blessed be the Lord God of my master, Abraham, who hath not left destitute my master of his mercy and his truth. I being in the way, the Lord led me to the house of my master's brethren. And that is a great statement there. I being in the way, the Lord led me. And the Lord leads those that are in the way, that is, that are in his way, that are wanting to be led, that will be led of him, that will do what he wants done. God can lead a willing heart any time. Now, verse 28, And the damsel ran and told them of her mother's house these things. And Rebekah had a brother, and his name was Laban. And Laban ran out unto the man unto the well." And friends, right here, let me warn you, keep your eye on Uncle Laban. He'll bear watching at this point. And from here on, he was greatly impressed by material things. Notice what happens, verse 30. It came to pass when he saw the earring and bracelets upon his sister's hands, and when he heard the words of Rebekah, his sister, saying, Thus spake the man unto me, that he came unto the man, and behold, he stood by the camels at the well. And the servant just waited out there at the well to see if anyone would come out to lead him into the home of Rebekah, whether he really had a welcome or not. Well, believe me, when old Laban saw those rings, he knew that it was a very wealthy guest. And Uncle Laban is not missing a deal And if you doubt that, you ask Jacob later on. Jacob found out Uncle Laban was a real trader. In fact, he was a better trader than he was. And so he went out, and he wanted to welcome him, and notice how he welcomes him. And he said, "'Come in, thou blessed of the Lord, wherefore standest thou without? For I have prepared the house and room for the camels.'" And even old Laban recognized the fact that there was the living God, the Creator, one God, very important. And he welcomed the man, and the man came into the house. He ungirded his camels, gave straw and provender for the camels, and water to wash his feet. And here we have this foot washing ceremony again, to wash his feet and the men's feet that were with him. You say he had quite a few that had come with him. Now the man is entertained royally, in this home. Uncle Laban sees to that. Now, we have seen in chapter 24 here that Abraham sent his servant back to his own country, the land of Haran, where he'd come from in Mesopotamia, in order that he might get a bride for Isaac. Now, I think as we come today to verse 32 that we ought to make this statement that here is a marvelous picture of the relationship of Christ and the church, which, by the way, one of the figures of speech that's used is that the church is to become someday the bride of Christ. And this is the way the church is being won today. The Father and the Son have sent the Holy Spirit into the world, and the Spirit of God, like this servant, has come to talk about another to take the things of Christ, show them unto us. Now, this servant has gone to get a bride for Isaac. The Spirit of God is in the world to call out a bride for Christ. Now, notice the marvelous, dramatic effect that we have here. This is a wonderful and an exciting story. Now, I'm reading verse 32. The man came into the house. 
He engirded his camels, gave straw and provender for the camels, and water to wash his feet and the man's feet that were with him. And there was set meat before him to eat, but he said, I'll not eat until I have told mine errand. And he said, Speak on. Now this servant of Abraham said, Before I can eat, I want to tell you my mission. The Holy Spirit's come into the world to tell about another. And that's primary business as far as God is concerned. Now, I know that there's other business that's very important, the business of our government. And, of course, the news is great business today. And the great corporations, the great automobile companies, the airplane companies, all this is important, is great business. But if you want to really know why God is continuing to deal with this world, very frankly, he's not continuing to deal with it because of General Motors or because of the government in Washington, either Republican or Democrat, make no difference. That's not primary in heaven. And the stock market in Wall Street is of no great concern in heaven. The thing that's primary as far as God is concerned to get the gospel out. The Spirit of God is here. Put this first. This servant wouldn't eat. And now they tell him to speak on. He said, I'm Abraham's servant. And you notice his name is not given. The Lord Jesus said when the Holy Spirit comes, he'll not speak of himself, but he'll take the things of mine and show them unto you. And by the way, what is the name of the Holy Spirit? has no name. He doesn't come to speak of himself. He's come to speak of Christ, of another. Now, this servant is a servant of Abraham. Now, notice verse 35. And the Lord hath blessed my master greatly, and he's become great. He hath given him flocks and herds and silver and gold and men servants and maid servants and camels and asses. He tells about the father's house and that is something the Spirit of God would have you know. When he comes, he'll convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Those are the three things that he talks to the lost world about, and that the judgment is upon a sinful earth and upon mankind, and men are lost today because they're sinners. I hear the Things said today, men are lost because they reject Christ. They are not lost because they reject Christ. They are lost because they're sinners. And whether they heard about him or not, they're lost sinners. That's our condition today. That's the condition of man. And the Holy Spirit's come to let us know that there is a Savior that has borne our judgment, and he's been made over to us righteousness We have a standing in heaven. He's come to speak of another. And now will you notice, the Lord hath blessed my master greatly, and he has all these things. How wonderful. My father is rich today in cattle and goods. Cattle on a thousand hills are his. How great our father is. Verse 36 And Sarah, my master's wife, bare a son to my master when she was old. And unto him hath he given all that he hath. And Lord Jesus, he's the inheritor. We are joint heirs with him today. He's come now to tell this family, I'm after a bride for my master's son, and he's going to inherit all things. Now, will you notice... And my master made me swear, saying, Thou shalt not take a wife to my son of the daughters of the Canaanites in whose land I dwell. And friends, he's calling out sinners, but they're sinners that are born again, not a corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, of the word of God that liveth and abideth forever. That's the ones he's calling out. Yes, sinners, but they've been made children of God. And if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. He's not taking Canaanites. They have to be transformed. Now will you notice, But thou shalt go unto my father's house, to my kindred, take a wife unto my son. And I said unto my master, Peradventure the woman will not follow me. And he said unto me, 
The Lord before whom I walk will send his angel with thee, and prosper thy way. Thou shalt take a wife for my son of my kindred my father's house. Then shalt thou be clear from this my oath when thou comest to my kindred. And if they give not thee one, thou shalt be clear from my oath. And I came this day under the well. And I said, O Lord God of my master Abraham, if now thou do prosper my way which I go, behold, I stand by the well of water. It shall come to pass that when the virgin cometh forth to draw water, and I say to her, Give me, I pray thee, a little water of thy pitcher to drink. And she say to me, Both drink thou, and I will also draw for thy camels. Let the same be the woman whom the Lord hath appointed out for my master's son. And before I had done speaking in mine heart, behold, Rebekah came forth with her pitcher on her shoulder, and she went down under the well and drew water. And I said unto her, Let me drink, I pray thee. And she made haste, let down her pitcher from her shoulder, and said, Drink, and I'll give thy camels drink also. So I drank, and she made the camels drink also. And I asked her, and I said, Whose daughter art thou? And she said, The daughter of Bethuel, Nahor's son, who milk a bear unto him. And I put the earring upon her face, and the bracelets upon her hands. And I bowed down my head, and worshipped the Lord, and blessed the Lord God of my master, Abraham, which had led me in the right way to take my master's brother's daughter unto his son. And now, if ye will deal kindly and truly with my master, tell me. And if not, tell me that I may turn to the right or to the left. Now, Laban is the spokesman for this family. Will you listen to him? And Laban and Bethuel answered and said, The thing proceedeth from the Lord. We cannot speak unto thee bad or good. Behold, Rebekah's before thee, take her and go, and let her be thy master's son's wife, as the Lord has spoken. They said, As far as we're concerned, this is of the Lord, and you go ahead and take her. But now notice, it came to pass that when Abraham's servant heard their words, he worshipped the Lord, bowing himself to the earth. And the servant brought forth jewels of silver, jewels of gold and raiment, and gave them to Rebekah. He gave also to her brother and to her mother precious things. Now, this is the way the Spirit of God does. We have the earnest of the Spirit when we come to Christ and being justified by faith. We have peace with God, we have access, we have joy, we have a hope, and we have the Holy Spirit. These are the wonderful things that have been made over to the believer today. Now we're told here in verse 54, they did eat and drink, he and the men that were with him. And they tarried all night, and they rose up in the morning, and he said, "'Send me away unto my master.'" And her brother and her mother said, Let the damsel abide with us a few days, at least ten after that she shall go. And the very next morning, this servant said, I want to be on my way. I tell you, this is big business for him. And the brother said, Why? What's your hurry? Give us at least ten days to tell her goodbye. But after all, we better talk this over with her. And he said unto them, Hinder me not, seeing the Lord hath prospered my way. Send me away, that I may go to my master. And they said, We'll call the damsel and inquire at her mouth. Now we've come to this very important part of this that I think is quite wonderful. I'm reading verse 58 now. Don't miss this. And they called Rebekah and said unto her, Wilt thou go with this man? And she said, I will go. Let's go back and look at this picture again. It's an oriental scene couched way back yonder in the beginning of time at the dawn of humanity in a way. And yet man had been on this earth, I'm confident, thousands of years at this time. But as far as we're concerned, it's 4,000 years ago. And here is this family that they are entertaining a guest. 
a stranger, and they're entertaining him royally. They fed his camels, taking care of the servants. They set meat before him, a real feast, and he wanted to state his business. He did. And he told his strange business he'd come to get a bribe for his master's son, Isaac. And I can see this servant there as he brings out these gifts that he's giving to the family, gold and silver and trinkets. Abraham, you must remember, was a very rich man. Then he begins to tell about the master. And as he does, I see in that circle, that family circle, around that fire, out in the background, a very beautiful girl standing just beyond the others with those deep brown eyes. She's listening, and you can tell she's listening. And as she listens, why, she hears the servant tell about Abraham tells about how Isaac was born, tells about his miraculous birth, tells about his life, and then tells about the day that his father took him yonder on the top of Mount Moriah to offer him as a sacrifice, and how God spared him and would not take his life and gave him back life to the father. And now how the father has sent him a servant to get a bride that they don't want to get one back there among the Canaanites. They've got one that must be a like mind, one that has the same capacity for the living God, must be born again, you see, of the Word of God. And they're looking for a bride. She's listening all that time. And the transaction goes on. Now they turn to her. No one's paid much attention to her up to this point. But now all eyes turn to Rebecca. They said, Rebecca, what about it? Will you go with this man? And she doesn't hedge or fudge or beat around the bush or hesitate. She says, I will go. <laughs> May I say to you, have you ever noticed the man that the Lord Jesus called when he was here on earth? They left their nets and followed him. Oh, I know they went back a couple of times, but there came a day when they broke loose from those nets. They never went back to them. They followed him. They went with him. He today is still calling the Holy Spirit, the one that's taken again the servant place. You see, the Father and the Spirit sent the Son into the world to die for the world. And now... The son said when he went back, he'd send the Holy Spirit, the Comforter. And he's come now into the world, and he's calling out a bride. And he's saying, will you go? Here is the one who died for you. He'll save you. You have to be redeemed first. You have to come as a sinner to him, take your rightful position, and accept him as Savior. And when you do, you'll be born again. You'll become a child of God put into the church that's going to be presented to him someday as a bride. And now you're to be interested in him. The question is, will you go? Will you accept the invitation? Will you trust Christ as your Savior? Now, you don't beat around the bush about this. You either do or you don't do. I never shall forget that I was speaking in a certain place back east fact of the matter of it was in Texas. And I presented Christ, and I said, will you accept him? And I wasn't really through preaching. I never shall forget. There sat a young man. I could tell he was interested. He just got right up right there and then walked down. <laughs> it had a tremendous effect upon the audience. He didn't have to be wishy-washy. There wasn't anything uncertain about him. My love a clean-cut decision like that. That's the way he wants you, friends. That's the way he'll accept you. And the only way that he will accept you. Now, will you notice this? That doesn't end the story. They start out now, and they're going back to the promised land. And on the way back, will you notice? Verse 59, they sent away Rebekah, their sister, and her nurse, and Abraham's servant, and his men. And they blessed Rebekah and said unto her, Thou art our sister, be thou the mother of thousands, of millions, and let thy seed possess the gate of those which hate them. That's been fulfilled, friends, already. 
We're not talking now about unfulfilled prophecy. This is fulfilled. And Rebekah arose and her damsels, and they rode upon the camels and followed the man. And the servant took Rebekah and went his way. And now, will you notice they had a long trip back. We're not told anything about that trip. But it's not easy riding a camel. I rode one from the little village there outside of Cairo down to the pyramids. And friends, that's as far as I want to ride on a camel. They call them the ship of the desert. Well, it is as rough as any trip I've ever had in a boat. It was rough. And they're not easy to ride. Imagine riding on those camels across the desert. I can see that they've had a hard day across that hot desert. And of an evening, they stop at an oasis. And the campfire is built. And they have their evening meal. And they're sitting there before time to go to bed and have their sleep. And I hear Rebecca say to this servant, Tell me about Isaac again. And the servant said, Well, what do you want me to tell you? Tell me about the way he was born. Tell me about the way that his father offered him on the altar. Tell me the old, old story of Jesus and his love. And the servant said, I told that to you last night. She said, I know, but tell it again. (laughs) Tell it again. And uh, he tells it again. Never grows old. And so that night she has that sweet sleep, dreaming of the time when she'll meet this one. And then the next day they start out on the journey again, and the desert isn't quite as hot, and the camel isn't quite as rough, but it's a long ways, and so they continue. And finally they come in sight of the land of promise. They enter it, and now they come down to Laharoi. And we read in verse 62, And Isaac came from the way of the well, Laharoi, for he dwelt in the south country, way down in the pleasant country, you see, down at Hebron and Beersheba. And Isaac went out to meditate in the field at the eventide, and he lifted up his eyes and saw, and behold, the camels were coming. Now we're given a view of the coming of Christ that we do not have. So many are saying today, won't it be wonderful when the Lord comes and we'll be caught up with him? Well, there's another view, and that's to be with him when he comes. And most of the church has already gone through the doorway of death, and they'll be coming with him when he comes, and that the bodies might be raised, and the spirit and the body joined together. Now, we read here that when he went out, they lifted up the eyes, and they saw the camels were coming. Those that are alive are to be caught up with the dead, be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And so those that have gone before in death... They're going to see him when he rises from the right hand of the Father. And then when he starts out to call his church and to meet his church yonder in the air. This is the picture. And what a glorious picture it is. And Rebecca lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she lighted off the camel. For she had said unto the servant, What man is this that walketh in the field to meet us? And the servant said, It's my master. Therefore she took a veil and covered herself. And we'll have to be clothed with the righteousness of Christ. But he's been made over to us righteousness. So he was delivered for our offenses and he was raised for our justification. That is, that we might have a righteousness that would enable us to stand before God. And so she wants to know who he is, whom having not seen we love. And I wonder today, when he does come, are we going to know him? Oh, I know there's a song, I shall know him, I shall know him by the print of the nails in his hands. And I think that's going to be the way that we're going to know him when he comes. This is the union of these two. What a glorious, beautiful, wonderful picture this is before us. Now we read in verse 66, And the servant told Isaac all things that he had done. The Holy Spirit will deliver us at the day of redemption. We've been sealed under the day of redemption. Believe me, this servant 
was going to get the bride to Isaac. And Isaac brought her into his mother's Sarah's tent. And he took Rebekah, and she became his wife. Now notice, and he loved her. The Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. And Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. And this reveals to you that Christ gains a great deal in our salvation. Oh, he wants us. He longs for us. Oh, that you and I today might be faithful to him, my beloved. Now today, our study brings us to the 25th chapter of Genesis. And this probably is getting to be a little monotonous to you, but we've come now to another great chapter of the Bible. And I'll have to keep saying this for, well, there are 50 chapters in Genesis, and I think you probably could say it for each chapter, and so I just keep saying it. But they are wonderful chapters here. And this one records the death of Abraham, and it gives the generations of Ishmael, and also the generations of Isaac, and the birth of the twins, Jacob and Esau, or Esau and Jacob, if you want them in chronological order, and then the experience of Esau and Jacob relative to the birthright, so that This is a remarkable chapter and covers a great deal of ground. Now, we saw last time how a bride was secured for Isaac, and that bride was Rebekah. And we read now in chapter 25, this will be the last mention of Abraham, that is, in the record, but frankly, his story ended back when the servant was sent out to get a bride for Isaac. I'm reading chapter 25 now and verse 1 of Genesis. Then again, Abraham took a wife, and her name was Keturah. Now, Abraham, after the death of Sarah, he married again, and this one is Keturah. And she bare him Zimran, Jokshan, and Medan, and Midian, and Ishbak, and Shua. And that's quite a family. He had his biggest family after the death of Sarah. And somebody raises the question, well, I thought that at the time of the birth of Isaac that this man, he was dead as far as his capability of bringing a child into the world. Friends, he was. But you see, this is an evidence of the fact that when God does something, he really does it. That's the reason that I believe that Anything that God does bears his signature. And right here, this man Abraham was not only able to bring Isaac into the world, but he now brings in this great family here. But the interesting thing that we have before us is that we have Medan and Midian. Now, the other boys, I'll be honest with you, that nations came from them, but I can identify them right now, and I'm not interested because they do not cross the pathway in Scripture. But Midian does. We'll find out that Moses, a little later on, goes down into the land of Midian, and he takes a wife there in Midian. Remember, that's in the line of Abraham and the Midianites also, so that you have here these other sons of Abraham, but we'll not follow them for the very simple reason that we're following Isaac. In Isaac is the way the Lord put it, your seed are called. It's through Isaac and not through any of these others, not through Ishmael, not through Midian or Medan. And all of these were men of the desert, nomads in that day. Now we come down to verse 5, And Abraham gave all that he had unto Isaac. And notice that. But unto the sons of the concubines which Abraham had, Abraham gave gifts and sent them away from Isaac his son, while he yet lived eastward unto the east country. And these are the days of the years of Abraham's life, which he lived a hundred, threescore, and fifteen years. Then Abraham gave up the ghost, died in a good old age, an old man, and full of years, and was gathered to his people." This is interesting. And his sons, Isaac and Ishmael, buried him in the cave of Machpelah 
in the field of Ephron, the son of Zohar, the Hittite, which is before Mamre, the field which Abraham purchased of the sons of Heth, there was Abraham buried, and Sarah his wife. Now, Ishmael comes for the funeral, because, after all, Abraham is his father. And here Isaac and Ishmael bury Abraham. In verse 11, we follow right along now. It came to pass after the death of Abraham that God blessed his son Isaac, and Isaac dwelt by the well La Haroi. That's where, you remember, he met Rebekah when she came to him. Now we have in verse 12, down through verse 18, the generations of Ishmael, Abraham's son, whom Hagar the Egyptian, Sarah's handmaid, bare unto Abraham. Now the list of them are given here, and I have no intention of reading this section at all, but to call your attention to the fact that this is the method of the Holy Spirit. This is the handwriting of the Spirit of God. And that is, in the book of Genesis, the rejected line is given first and then set aside, not mentioned anymore, and the line that's leading to Christ is given. And therefore, after we have the line of Ishmael, then we come in verse 19, and we have here, and these are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham begat Isaac. Now, this is the line we're going to follow. And you will find this in the first chapter of the book of Genesis. Abraham begat Isaac. Isaac begat Jacob. Each one of these had other sons, as we've seen. Abraham had quite a few sons here, but they're not mentioned, that is, the genealogy of these men's not followed at all. Only the genealogy of Isaac is followed. And now we read in verse 20, we're following Isaac from now on. You can forget Ishmael, and you can forget Midian and Medan. Now, they'll cross the path of the sons of Abraham through Isaac time and again. Now, Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah to wife, the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian of Paden Aram, the sister to Laban the Syrian. And Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord was entreated of him, and Rebekah his wife conceived. Now, this girl Rebekah is barren. Now Isaac beseeches the Lord and she now is going to give birth to twins. Verse 22, And the children struggle together within her. And that is a very interesting statement. In fact, it's so interesting that you can follow it right on through the Scripture. This is the struggle. You find that that is the struggle that goes on today in the world. There is a struggle between light and darkness, between good and evil, between the spirit and the flesh. And every child of God knows something of that struggle. It's what's set before us in the seventh of Romans. And the children struggle together within her. And she said, If it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord. She didn't quite understand. And now... Verse 23, And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy being. And the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. Now, this is the statement that God makes to her. The elder is to serve the younger. Now, she should have believed it. And also her son that was the younger should have believed it, because God says that the elder shall serve the younger. Now verse 24, And when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. And the first came out red, all over like a hairy garment, and they called his name Esau. That means red, by the way. He came out red, earth-colored. He's the eldest, but the eldest to serve the younger. And after that came his brother out, and his hand took hold on Esau's heel, 
and his name was called Jacob, and Isaac was threescore years old when she bare them. Actually, they'd been married there for about 20 years before the children were born. These two boys, and the oldest, as Esau, he's old red, if you please, earth-colored, and Jacob, and they called him that, the usurper. And he took hold on Esau's heel, and he's trying to become the elder or take his place. But God's already promised that to him, and he should have believed God. Now we look at these two boys as they grow up in this home. And the boys grew, and Esau was a cunning hunter and a man of the field, and Jacob was a plain man dwelling in tents. Now, here are the two boys. They're twins, but no two boys were ever as different as these two are. They not only struggled in the womb, but they are against each other from here on out. They just absolutely have different viewpoints, a different philosophy of life. Their thinking is different. Their attitude is different. Now, at the very beginning, I must confess that Esau is more attractive than Jacob is. But you see, you can't always judge by the outward sign. You have to judge by what takes place on the inside. Frankly, you need to see that in this particular case here. The boys grew. Esau was a cunning hunter, a man of the field, and Jacob was a plain man dwelling in tents. Now, this fellow Esau is a cunning hunter. He's a man of the field. He's the athletic type, the outdoor boy, the one that we'd call him today the all-American boy. He went in for sport. He went in for everything that was physical, but he had no spiritual ability whatsoever, our understanding, our capacity, our desire. It was always for that which was physical. He represents the flesh. And Jacob was a plain man. And I think that you can make of that anything you want to, dwelling in tents. He's indoors. He was mama's boy. He was tied to his mama's apron string. You'll notice that he moved and did what she told him to do. He is really a mama's boy. And this boy Esau is papa's boy, though. Verse 28, And Isaac loved Esau because he did eat of his venison, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Now you have the problem right here in the home. You would feel that under these circumstances... They're going to have trouble, and they are, because when one parent's partial to one child and the other parent's partial to the other child, then you have trouble. And that's exactly what took place here. And Isaac loved him because he ate of his venison. Esau went out hunting, and he always got something when he went out hunting. He brought home venison. And Isaac liked that, and he liked this boy. He's the outdoor type. And Rebecca loved Jacob. He's a mama's boy. And very frankly, at this particular juncture, I must confess that this boy Esau is much more attractive. In fact, he seems to be more of a wholesome boy. This boy Jacob is cunning. He tries to be clever. In fact, the matter is, he doesn't mind stooping to do things that are absolutely wrong. God will deal with him. But the interesting thing, though the Esau may be very attractive on the outside, down underneath he had really no capacity for God whatsoever. And if there ever was a man of the world, he's that man of the world. He is just the physical man, and that's all. That's all he lived for. But down underneath Jacob, there was a desire for the things that are spiritual. And it took a long time for God to rub off all of the debris on top and to remove all the coverings to get down where it was. But he finally did. And we'll see before we're through with this man Jacob, and he goes almost all the way through the book of Genesis now, that he was God's man all the way along, but he didn't demonstrate it 
until late in life. And we'll come to that. Now we are told here an incident that took place in their home there. Now, you can well understand that in a home like this, that things would not be too even. There would be the difficulty. There would be this matter of conflict, and it would not be called a happy home. Verse 29, And Jacob sawed pottage, and Esau came from the field, and he was faint. And Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, for I am faint. Therefore was his name called Edom. And Jacob said, Sell me this day thy birthright. And Esau said, Behold, I am at the point to die, and what profit shall this birthright do to me? Now, will you notice this incident reveals, frankly, the nature of both of these men. Esau came from the field. He was outdoors, and he was tired. He was exhausted. Now, he's not starving to death, as some would imply. And no one that had been brought up in the home of Abraham is going to get hungry. There'd be something for him to eat. The thing was, there was nothing prepared to eat at that moment but this pottage, this stew or soup that Jacob had made. Jacob's the indoor boy. He's a good chef, but not outdoors. He just does his cooking inside. And Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with that same red. Pottage actually is not in the original. For I am faint, therefore was his name called Edom. And that means red. It means earthy. And this man, he just asked his brother, Give me some of this to eat. Now Jacob said, and he's a trickster, he's a traitor. He said, sell me this day thy birthright. Now, Jacob wanted that birthright. Now, what was the value of the birthright? Let's look at it for a minute. In that day, it meant several things. It meant that the one who had it was the head of the house. It also meant that the one that had it was the priest of the family. And in this family, it meant the one that had it would be the one that would be in the line that would lead to Christ. Now, do you think that Esau valued it at all? Jacob knew that he didn't, that he attached no importance to it at all. He didn't care about being the priest of the family. In fact, that's the last thing that he wanted to do. He just wouldn't do that sort of thing. I feel today, sometimes when I hear Christians, especially some man who's a Christian, they ask him to do something, say, oh, I'm not a preacher. I can't do that. Well, sure, you may not be a preacher, but you see that there are too many today that don't want to do that which is spiritual. They don't want to even give the impression that they are spiritual or interested in spiritual things. Esau, he didn't want to give that impression. Anyone that would have called him deacon or preacher would have insulted him. He didn't want the birthright. And he didn't care about being in the line that led to Christ. fact of the matter is, no one could have cared less than he did about being in the line that leads to Christ. And so Jacob sees that. And he says to him, I'll tell you what I'll do. If you'll give me your birthright, I'll give you a bowl of soup. And Esau says, I'll be very glad to do it. What profit is the birthright to me? What I care about the birthright. It's not worth a bowl of soup to me. The value that he attached to spiritual things. Now, the thing that's wrong about Jacob, of course, God has promised him the elder shall serve the younger. The birthright's coming to Jacob in God's own time. Jacob, though, can't wait. And so he reaches out to take that which God has promised him, and he's taking it in, let us say, a clever, tricky fashion. He should not have done it this way. He should have waited for God to give it to him. But you'll find out this man can't wait. And after all, this man operated on the principle what I can do myself, there's no reason for me to look to God to do it. 
He felt thoroughly capable of taking care of his business. And he did pretty well as far as the world would measure it at the beginning. But there came a day when God really sent him to college. And Laban was the president of the college. And it was known as the College of Hard Knocks. And he's really going to learn a few things in the College of Hard Knocks. But so far, he's operating on the principle that he's clever enough to get what's coming to him. Verse 33 now, And Jacob said, Swear to me this day. And he swore unto him, and he sold his birthright unto Jacob. And Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, and he did eat and drink, and rose up, went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. That's the important thing to see at this juncture. This man just sits down, eats a bowl of soup, and for that bowl of soup he surrendered his birthright just like that. It meant nothing to him. It had no spiritual value to him whatsoever because nothing that was spiritual meant anything to him. Now, you meet a great many people that are that way. And unfortunately, I'm afraid we got church members that are like that, have no spiritual capacity whatsoever, no understanding of spiritual truth. And that, I think, is the mark of a Christian today, is that one that the Spirit of God can teach and lead and guide. This is quite a revelation now of the two boys. Actually, here he's deceiving no one. He's just taking advantage of a man that doesn't attach any value to it at all. It's just like a man today that has a very valuable heirloom, say an old Bible that belonged to his grandfather. And another grandson wants it, and he pays him 25 cents for it. And the fellow says, well, give me your 25 cents. I don't care for it at all. And I was going to throw it away anyway. And that's exactly what Esau would have done. But this boy Jacob did this very cleverly. But now in this next chapter, and we're going to have to save that till next time, we're going to see he's really a rascal, by the way.